Are you? Yes, I am. Yes. Amen. Behold what manner of love, right? The fathers bestowed on us that we would be called the sons of God. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being in church on Sunday. Could be a Labor Day weekend extravaganza, but you're here for church. And that means that it's a priority, it's important to you, and I'm thankful that you're here. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter number 16. We're going to get into the Word of God. We've been uh, delving in for a little over a year uh, with the Gospel of Luke, and uh, we have 24 chapters to navigate. We will finish chapter 16 and be in the, uh, the home stretch, as it were. Um, last week we caught the first 18 verses and looked at uh, manage failure well. We looked at stewardship, the unjust steward, the parable and teaching of Jesus Christ and stewardship. And of course, there has been many a time where Jesus Christ has um, highlighted teaching to the disciples. And then he's highlighted a, a principle to the crowd or a miracle, of course, with teaching behind it. He's taught, um, had parable teaching uh, at different settings and, and uh, seen the Pharisees push back against him, the scribes, uh, you know, even very simple here in chapter 16. If you go even very to the very first verse of chapter 16, I do this often just to get a kind of feel where we're at. It says, and he said unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man. So we know the audience, and we've, we've established this very important. Jesus is the teacher. He is the master teacher. He is uh, the son of God and the son of man who's come to seek and to save that which is lost. And he has got an audience in chapter 16, and he taught the unjust steward parable to that group of people, his disciples. But if you go in there to a little bit further on, you go to verse 14, in follow-up to that setting of teaching, it says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. So the Pharisees are around the doubters, the deriders, the ones that say, hey, no, I'm going to look. I'm gonna, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift up my s nose against you. I'm going to deride you. I'm going to sneer at you, the Word of God says. In fact, just to get you a perspective of what it means that they derided him, go to Luke 23, just for a minute, just as part of our introductory comments. Luke chapter number 23, we know what's going on here in 23. It's the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He has made some statements from the cross. You know that there's seven of them and included right here in Luke 23, verse 34. Here's Jesus speaking. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. So here's Jesus hanging on the cross for the sins of all mankind. And yet it says there immediately they parted lots over his garments. What happens in the next verse, verse 35? The people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying he saved others, let him save himself if he be Christ, the chosen of God. Wow. Why do you bring that up, Pastor? Well, it kind of sets the groundwork for today. Go back to Luke 16, because Jesus Christ is teaching a story, a parable, a passage. It could be said that it's not a parable. It's a little different. He's not going to use pictures and similitudes. He's really given an account. Uh, it might be one of those, uh, he changed the names and addresses to protect the innocent. But he's using a poor man whose name is Lazarus. So he actually gives a name to this man. And he speaks of a certain rich man, and he goes into... A little bit of a description of him having, of course, uh, you know, acceptance in his community and being very rich and such. And some would say this could be looked at just simply as another parable, but all the parables of Jesus, for the most part, had those similitudes. It had, hey, the sheep if it's lost, the coin if it's lost, you know, different things like that. And this time, to me, we have an accounting of something that is factual and we really dig into a subject matter that ties together to 
the audience that is here to listen what Jesus has to say, and Jesus is going to move his language to a place where, hey, this rich man could easily represent the Pharisees, the scribes. You say, why is that, Pastor? Because the rich man spent all of his energy on the things of this world and acted as though everything was going to be just fine in his own selfish self-righteous way until he takes his last breath <clears throat> just as the poor man lazarus takes his last breath this beggar and they both end up having to deal with eternity one in a very positive way and one in a very negative way and you think about what jesus is doing on the cross for all mankind and he is dying for the sins of the rich man he's dying for the sins of lazarus one it shows us is in Abraham's bosom, the other is not. Oftentimes we think about lost people as being unreachable. Today, you know, last week we looked at the unjust steward. We talked about stewardship. We spoke of that. But as Jesus continues to teach us through Luke's gospel, we go verse by verse and passage by passage. There are many evangelistic type of or soul winning messages we've had. We've had discipleship messages. We've had uh, deeper theological messages. We had steward messages. And on and on it goes because we're just teaching what God is showing us in his scripture. Today, I want you to consider the depth and the truth of hell. Sheol, Hades, one day Gehenna as the lake of fire. And consider that it's real because they woke up and there he was in torment. You're going to see the word torment mentioned four times. Maybe today at the end of our days, we will realize that there's others at the end of our days some of you, hey, you're saved, you're born again, can't wait to get out of here, I'll be in the presence of Jesus. I hope you change that thinking. There's nothing wrong with longing to go see Jesus, absolutely not. But you ought to be longing to see Jesus as the believer and follower of Christ and that same passion and desire you have, it's I'd love to have one other person not have to go to a place of torment. How is it that we always want to take the path of least resistance? Well, that's kind of the way we go when we're believers in some form or fashion. Remember those days when you were convicted, you were compelled, you were burdened, you were aching in your soul for the soul of another? Today, consider torment. Consider hell. Consider that it's very, very real. And maybe, just maybe, the Word of God, the Spirit of God will get on your case like it has on mine again and again and again. Teaching the disciples, yes, but there's Pharisees and scribes and religious people there's a crowd, there's people listening to Jesus everywhere, and he's on his way to the cross. He's on his way to Jerusalem. But here he is, is stopping by on the course of his life and earthly ministry saying, let me teach you about this rich man. Teach you about Lazarus. Pick up with me scripture, verse number nine, at the end of our days. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. You know, in order to get that kind of ink, you had to be a rich person because it was a shellfish that produced that purple ink in order for that particular garment to be turned into that beautiful color. That tells you right off the bat that he is very rich. He fared sumptuously. That means that he didn't miss a meal. At a good table. In fact, when we see later in the scripture, he says, hey, I have a father and five brethren. And could you send somebody to them? He has a home. He has brothers. This man is truly rich. Verse 20 tells us there's a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores 
and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. What an awful plight for a person to be in a place where he just wants crumbs off the table of the rich man. In portrayal, simply put, a rich Jew and a poor Jewish man. But now we know that in context and by application, it can be brought to the Gentile, the barbarian, the Greek, this message of God's incredible grace and mercy, but also God's divine judgment and the torment that comes because of the sin upon us. It says in verse number 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. We know that the angels are messengers of the Lord, and so they have to help out a little bit here and there. We see here this text that the angels, in Jesus' account, they carried the beggar. It's pretty profound when you stop and think. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Remember, it's not the things that are determining whether he is there or not. It's the condition of a soul that has found the grace of God and one that has rejected. Simple, clear. It's not predicated on their physical condition, but it is two different people that had a physical life that now they have an eternal life in one of two places. Verse 26 says, besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear. They have the word of God. They have the scriptures. Let them hear. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Of course, another miracle, a miracle, that'll do it. If you don't believe the word, if you won't believe me, because that's what verse 31 says. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. You won't even believe the new covenant. Father in heaven, it's our time in your word. We've had a few moments of singing and praising your name, and now we're in prayer. We've already prayed a little bit. My prayer, very simply, is that you will work in each person here in this gathering time for us to grasp, grab hold of what you're teaching Jesus to the people of that time that now we get the teaching from you and your holy and living word. I pray, God, that we would leave this gathering time reproved and convicted and in a place where we understand that at the end of our days, there will be people in torment, and there will be people in glory. God, do your work on each one of our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. As I titled it, At the End of Our Days, it ties together a little bit to where we've been with Jesus and his teaching the last few chapters, since chapter 13, going to chapter 19, when we know it's the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Consider what we did last week. We must recognize our ministry life will have greater success as we manage the failure around us well. I mentioned that yesterday. Be a just 
and faithful steward. I even have up on there verses 11 and 12 out of chapter 16. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Why are you bringing that back up? Because that was again at the root and the core of our word last week of our sermon time and our message and i mentioned to you you're saved born again some of you many of you maybe most of you i know so many of you personally have you been stewarding your salvation well are we stewarding the gospel well? Are we stewarding the doctrines and the theology of what God has taught us through other people in our lives, through this church? People say, oh, we, we teach the Bible, 27 years, First Bible Baptist Church. Boy, I'll tell you what, ADP Sports and ADP Sports Park are going to celebrate 20 years. September 12, 2004, we were out on those fields big circle of people there's a picture of it out there and we were praying that god would give us a harvest of souls 20 years later has it been that way i know so many people that have come to first bible come to know the lord over those years and i think have we stewarded that well have we stewarded giving the gospel of the lord jesus christ to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children and families and here we are today saying okay this torment thing this hell thing this <laughs> haiti sheol place before the great white throne how are we doing at the end of our days and at the end of the days of someone else can God trust us, and has God been entrusting us, and have we taken his trust with what we have in the word of God, in the gospel, and done what he was wanting us to do with it? You see, no man can serve two masters, it says up there, for either will hate the one and love the other, or else he will love, hold to the one and despise the other. Jesus continually brought this up. You cannot serve God and mammon. So this is another piece of the stewardship that's going to come right into this rich man and poor man in their lives. The Lord admonished the disciples that he required devotion. You cannot split your devotion. I worship God today, and I'll worship myself tomorrow, and I'll worship my wife tomorrow, and I'll worship my children tomorrow. No, no, you worship the Lord God first. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength first. Then love your neighbor as yourself. And now we have another lesson where money's brought up, and there's a conflict that money can bring as a master over the one who should be master. Stewardship was about possessions last week, money, yes, unrighteous mammon that Jesus said, hey, that's really coming into play. Can someone, though, on the other side who has no money really love money and have money become their master? Absolutely. You don't have to have a lot of it. You can be poor to allow and still allow money and riches and possessions and this life that we have here on this earth be more important. And take up more energy i highlighted just three parables that we've covered on the next slide what happened to the parable in the parable of the rich fool go to luke chapter number 12. here's your 90 second bible study this morning here you go what happened in the parable of the rich fool with his need to have more i thought we were already having a bible study well, this is an extra this is Pick it up in verse number 16 in chapter number 12. And he spake a parable, Jesus unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And so he says, Hey, I'll pull down the barns I have, I'll build some more, I'll be able to store more, and then I'll be able to say, Soul, thou hast many goods for many years. I'm all set with life. I have ease, eat, drink, and be merry. God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? He needed to have more. What happened? Jesus taught a parable about it. Go to Luke 14 real quick. What happened in the parable of the Great Supper? Verse number 16. 
and said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade him and sent his servant up or, uh, to supper time and said to them, Hey, all those that were bidden, so they had an invitation. Now he's letting them know, Hey, everything's all ready to go. With, it says in verse 18, And they all with one consent began, began to make excuse, and each one of them got, brought an excuse. When the servant came, he showed the Lord these things. The master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go quickly and find some other peoples. <laughs> Go to the streets, the lanes of the city, bring in the hither, bring in hither the poor, maimed, halt, blind. Hey, hey, maybe they have to be physically poor in order for them to understand that I will bring the riches into their life. What happened in the parable of the Great Supper? With the excuses not to attend, Jesus taught it through and showed that the possessions in the life of this, this world cannot take priority over Jesus Christ, though it is very real that we have to live in it. And then, of course, the, par uh, the parable of the prodigal son in chapter 15. A certain man had two sons. In verse number 11, the younger said unto his father, Father, give me the portion. Remember, he divided unto his living. And what does it say in verse 13? The word prodigal means waste, waster. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. In verse 14 it says, And what he had spent all, he had nothing. Each one of those parables covers this particular subject that at the end of the days, or as we like to say around here, at the end of the day, at the end of our days of living, Jesus is saying very simply, rich fool, people that have been invited to the great supper, prodigal son, there is going to be an eternity. And it won't be this world. It'll be another place, another world. I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house. And I think to myself here sitting on this, this text, once again, why did Jesus put it forward? It's very clear to me. We need to be put down on our haunches, put down on our put down on our knees, but just be brokenhearted and realize that the soul of a person is very serious to God, and it could end up in torment. What would Jesus Christ's lesson be like today for the many prosperous citizens of the USA? Does the account of the rich man and Lazarus by Master Jesus convey a relatable truth for us? Is it possible there is a large amount of people too rich in the things of this temporal life? Let me expand for a moment on that, and what do I mean? Maybe it's the riches of all of your Bible knowledge. Maybe you're just a theological Bible genius. Has that gotten in the way of your concern and burden for the souls that could end up in torment? Could it be the riches of this life and the paying of the bills? The prosperity of the time that we live in in the United States of America isn't just tied to money going into your checking account, because there are people that have less and people that have more. But the things that you can possess from a phone to a family to the riches of this beautiful life that God's given us in the United States. You say, wow, look at everything that we have. And keep in mind this, nowhere does this teaching of Jesus Christ ever say that this rich man got his money because he was evil or wicked or bad. So it doesn't mean that it was ill-gotten, but it does mean that the rich man got caught up in the possessions of life. Maybe the job, maybe the status, maybe, very simply put, it was who he was amongst all of his family members. You see, at the end of our days today, and again, I'm not just saying, hey, because any message could be, well, this was the last message you heard, or this was the last message you were to give. I'm not saying it that way. I'm just simply saying this. Jesus, in our teaching, going through chapter after chapter, verse upon verse, passage upon passage, this is the passage today. 
And there is another world beyond this world. And God has been telling us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Give no thought for the morrow, for the morrow will take care of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Go through that Sermon on the Mount. We've mentioned it last week. Hey, back to chapter number 16, verse 13. You can't serve two masters. Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain. Go through it, read it, study it. I've said it often. If you want to spend the last few years or the middle years or even your early years in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and have it really become even more meaningful in terms of living like Christ, then go study his gospels. Go study what he's saying. Go read what he's saying. Grasp in the moment what Jesus was doing with the audience, telling this and saying, what are you doing here? I'm your audience right now. There's a beggar that ended up in Abraham's bosom. There's a rich man that ended up in torment. What am I going to do with that? Four simple things that are our supportive lesson points to our statement at the end of our days. Our first one. When our days here are complete, will God find people who were negligent of their spiritual growth in exchange for financial growth? Will God find people who were negligent? They were careless of their spiritual growth to make light. This is a Jewish man in our thinking process. What would he do every Sabbath? He'd walk to synagogue. He would go here the scriptures read and prayer time and scripture and prayer and they would be there for a long period of time in the sabbath what did he do with all of that was he negligent over his spiritual growth it says there in chapter number 16 that he was a rich man clothed in purple as i mentioned earlier so he's he's at the high end of things he's very affluent he definitely <laughs> has acceptance, as I mentioned before, of, hey, this is a rich guy. Everybody knows him. In fact, so much so that the beggar Lazarus is at the bottom and the foot and the underneath the, the table for the scraps and for the crumbs. He has an abundance of anything and everything he could possibly have. While the poor, the poor guy, Lazarus, <laughs> He's got physical problems. I'm not so sure having a dog lick my sores would feel very good. Oh, maybe that was medicinal. I doubt it. Unless the dog had like cortisone cream on his tongue. I don't know. If the dogs are licking from him, it's a whole nother and he's licking from the table. You can imagine the disparity in these two people and how the Lord Jesus Christ is painting it as as big of a chasm as possible between two. He is in a perilous place in his life where his physical needs are barely being met. So when our days here are complete, Will God find people who were negligent over their spiritual growth to grow beyond, to bear fruit, to tell people about Jesus Christ? Well, let me just show you a, a supportive passage of Scripture that is really strong in discipleship, and we use it around here uh, in different ways and, and enough, but there's something more to it. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 1. I have highlighted up on there, 5 through 9, and then verse 12. 2 Peter, chapter number 1. I, again, for this passage, I've used this as a reference a few different times here and there. Of course, Peter starts out with a great greeting to the believers in the early times, of course, and he then goes a little bit further. This is a plug for 2 Peter starts up in a couple Wednesdays. Yeah, Bible study on Wednesday night, verse number 5. 
And beside this giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. This is all part of the spiritual growth. To knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This would be someone who says, hey, I'm concerned about my spiritual growth, and my financial growth is important, but it's no way close to being more important than my spiritual growth. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. If you stop right there, it's still a great passage of Scripture. Break it down. We'll go to verse number 12. It's up on the screen. And I have emboldened, emboldened a word there. Verse number 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Peter's saying, I am not going to be negligent when it comes to something that you already know, but I'm going to put it in remembrance to you, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. I like what Peter's teaching there. It's one of my favorite approaches to preaching and teaching. He said, boy, you repeat yourself an awful lot. I took it from there. I already know that. You know one of the worst responses you can get from someone when you tell them something that they may already kind of be aware of, but you're over-communicating. You say, I know, I know, I know. You don't like it when a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old tells you that, parent and grandparent. You don't like that in children's ministry. You don't like it in youth ministry when the little kids say, I know, leave me alone, I know. Peter's saying, wherefore, I will not be negligent. I will not be careless. I will not make light of my responsibility to put you always in remembrance of these things. Of what? your salvation in Jesus Christ, your growth, spiritually speaking, your sanctification, your holiness. How can we not see how important this is? And on the other side of things, Jesus Christ is putting before this rich man and beggar parable story, factual content, and of course an accounting that somebody put their financial growth over their spiritual growth. God's going to see those people one day. Our second one, go back to Luke chapter number 16. When our days here are complete, will God find people in negotiations over the torment that confronts them in eternity? What do you mean? Well, the first three verses there, 19 through 21, show us how important his status and his place was on one side as the rich man, and of course the status and clear brokenness of Lazarus, physically speaking. But we don't know until right now what happens when they take their last breath. Verse 23 says, hey, I mean, verse number 22 says, hey, the beggar died, was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. Woo! Rich man died, buried. No highlight there. Nobody carried him except for the pallbearers to the ground. But his soul continued. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, seeing Abraham afar off. and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, I want you to keep in mind this as we just walk through this, that this man's attitude, countenance, he never ever has spoken to say that, I'm so sorry, I repent, even knowing it would be too late. Boy, I wasted my life. No, he, of course, people would say he's concerned about his family. Yeah, but this man, he's in negotiation over the torment that he's in. You can't negotiate with God. The reality is there are people that are attempting to negotiate with God all the time. Right now, before they take their last breath, it'll be pretty, pretty sad when this interaction goes on with someone else 
because it says in verse 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. <clears throat> Who's Abraham picturing? The father. Have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Oh, please don't tell me that there's a hell that exists. Oh, I'm telling you what God says. In the Hebrew, in the Greek, in the English, period, there is a place of torment. Have we forgotten? People say, well, you don't ever want to tell people just get fire insurance, get saved, to get out of hell. But I will say that I didn't get saved for that reason. I get saved because I was so convicted by my wicked life, probably like you. Or even at a young age, you said, I don't want to go to hell and have to pay for my own sins. If Jesus died for my sins, I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus. I'll receive the gift. I'll call in the name of the Lord to save me. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. If a little six-year-old can read it as a testimony of baptismal, you ought to be able to say it too. You say, I know I'm born again, I'm saved. You ought to know how you got saved and what you got saved out of. You had to pay for your own sins without Jesus. And you would spend eternity in torment. Matthew 22, verses 1 through 6. Another place where the word negligent is brought in through the concordance. In this parable, the wedding feast, in Matthew chapter number 22, it starts out by saying, Jesus answered, spake unto them in parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come into the marriage. What does it say in verse 5? But they made light of it. They neglected. I say no to the gospel and I want to go to hell. I know that's not what it says. And they went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant took his servants and treated them spitefully and slew them. For you to take serious and for me to take serious as a believer that torment is hell and hell is torment and that it is the eternal damnation for the soul that's already condemned by their own sins. God didn't condemn you, you condemned yourself. And so God pulled it all together with his holiness and righteousness and said there must be a place. This is God, and this is God alone. If you're lost today and you have never called in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, let me just tell you, all of us at one time understood that they were sinners, and they needed Jesus Christ as Savior. There is none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's not slack concerning that promise. And he said, I love you so much that I sent my only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, nothing else, nothing else, believe in Jesus and Jesus alone. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by him. I will tell you that your eternal destiny will no longer be a place of torment. When our days are complete, there will be people that will be negotiating with God to no avail. Third one, when our days here are complete, will God find people who were neglectful of living life in allegiance to God's will instead of themselves? That includes everything having to do with Scripture, God's will. I mentioned it just a moment ago. 
Number one on the top of the list is I desire for you to be saved. The Lord is not slack concerning that. It is his will. He's not willing that any should perish. Any child, adult, older person. And when our days here are complete, I think that God will find people who are neglectful of living life in allegiance to God's will. The lost people that said, hey, these Jews, they said, hey, I know the old covenant's there. I got it, but too bad. Well, the old covenant pointed to the new. The new is Jesus. He's the better. In fact, go to Hebrews chapter number 8 with me. He is the better. He is Jesus. Well, I know the whole old covenant, but you're neglectful of living life and allegiance to God's will. You live for yourself, and eternity will be a place of torment. Jesus spoke about the existence of hell so very many times. He said that he spoke of it, of course, more than even heaven. And Jesus Christ is saying, hey, there are people that I'm going to see that are going to be neglectful. Hebrews chapter number 8. It says up on there, pick it up with verse number 7, I believe, with me. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second covenant. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Simple concordance study. That's saying very simply the same thing. I regarded them not. As they were negligent to me and neglectful to me, I regarded them not, saith the Lord. But in his mercy, verse number 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, will put my laws into their minds, write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. Through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the second covenant, the better testament. Verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteous, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That's God's mercy. Why would we not want to have someone know this? understand it enough to come to know Jesus. You take it and you you keep it all for yourself? Verse 13 says, And that he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Because all is new in Jesus Christ. All in that better covenant is Jesus. He is the better testator, the better sacrifice, the better priest. That's the book of Hebrews. People need to know what you know. Instead of saying, I know, say, okay, God, as my days grow older, how much longer will I wait to be saved? One thing to be a saved person and not do much with it and let people spend eternity in torment. Forgive me, Lord, again. Verse number 25 and 26 in Luke 16 remind us son, Abraham said, son, like a child, your lifetime had good things Lazarus' life had evil things. But guess what now? There is a gulf that's great and it's fixed and you can't go back and forth. You are neglectful of living your life in allegiance to my will, holy God, and you lived it for yourself.
Lastly, when our days here are complete, will God find us still negative toward the truth of his word that all sinners must repent, must repent to be saved? I set us up there. You say, sure, I know that. Of course I do. I'm a born-again believer. All things are new in my life. I know Jesus is my Savior. I'm a son of God. Then how is it that we act like Are we still negative toward the truth? Oh, don't mention hell. Don't mention repentance. Um, Jesus mentioned them both quite a bit. If I'm going to make hope known to someone who's in a place of hopelessness, then I've got to get to that place where a conversation is coming over the first, second, third, fourth time that I'm going to talk to him. Which means I need to be really gracious, loving, kind and build something up or maybe it's just a cold call i need to say hey have you ever called out to jesus to save your soul save me for what i don't have to be saved well there's a place called hell it's a place of torment you can call it hades and sheol and know that hey greek again or english or or hebrew it's the destiny of torment Or how would you like to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ when you take your last breath? When you know that one, you can say, I know I'm going to be with Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, because I called out to him to save me, forgive me, turning from my rotten ways, turning from my selfishness, my religiousness, my Baptist and Lutheran and all my ways that I got. I know the Methodist church can't save me. I know the Assembly of God church. I I know this Baptist church can't save me, but Jesus Christ can save my soul. He's the one. Am I negative toward the truth of his word? No, pastor, not in this setting. But are you negative toward the truth that all sinners must repent and believe in Jesus Christ to be saved? That's the Bible. That's Jesus teaching it again and again and again and again. And in case you don't like him teaching it, just open up the Bible anywhere. And it says the same thing over and over and over again. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man will come to the Father but by him. You will escape that evil, wicked hell of a tormenting place for all of eternity if you call in the name of the Lord to save you. And you and I need to tell people, you're going to go to hell. You say, that's awful mean. We use that word all the time as a lost person. I used to say, I can't wait to die with all my buddies. We're going to go to hell and have a New Year's Eve party every night. Remember? That's what we're going to do. And I ain't in the Bible. Well, I'll go to purgatory and have some soul sleep. It's not in the Bible. The truth of the matter is, once you and I take our last breath on this earth, we're going to spend, one, spend eternity in one of two places. And we know now Abraham's bosom, because he left captivity, kept is right where he is, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be in his presence. But those that aren't in Jesus, they'll be in a place of torment for all of eternity. Go to Hebrews chapter number two as I remind you what this man was desperately wanting, yet he still had not confronted what he had not done. He said in verse 27, Father, hey, would you send somebody to my father's house? You know who you could send? It'd be a miracle. Send Lazarus. Well, I heard there was another Lazarus guy who got raised from the dead. Anyway, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come into the place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, 
Moses, prophets, let them hear them. Today, hear what the Word of God says. Hear what the Gospels say. Hear the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear about how the old covenant was abolished and the new covenant came into play in the Lord Jesus Christ. If they hear not Moses and prophets, neither they be persuaded. Even me, I injected that. The one rose from the dead. Hebrews 2, and we're done. It's right up on the screen. Hebrews chapter number 2. Whew. Verse number 1 says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which have, we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. And if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect, if we neglect, if we neglect so great salvation? You say, well, I'm saved, I'm already born again, I know that I never neglected it, but all people that have neglected it and continue to neglect it that you know, maybe you're here today and you have, why would you want to neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, it was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, with divers miracles, and the gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Whew. Oh, thank you, Jesus. What will we decide today? What will we decide to do about all those people who God will see in a state of torment at the end of their days. What will we do? I need to be pushed like this all the time. Please stand for a word of prayer. My Holy Father in heaven, I, I simply come to you boldly at the throne of grace, but humbly with great need for your mercy upon my wasted years and your grace to fill so that at the end of our days, we will be the witnesses that we need to be. I pray for those here today. God, there may be someone who's never trusted in you, Jesus. I pray for them to be saved today. And I pray for all those that are sons of God, that we would take this exhortation from your word, Jesus, put it in our lives, and move to be a person who brings the message to save a soul from torment. In Jesus' name. As the...